they're the ones that are going to suffer the most. Yeah, we can talk about that forever, but I just yeah. want folks to really hear, please hear that money is here today, gone tomorrow. You can always make more money, but your loved ones cannot replace you. They'd rather have you than the money. I swear. I promise you. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you smash the like and subscribe buttons. If you're listening to our podcast, go leave us a five-star review. All of our links can be found in the video description or show notes below. Hey, welcome back to the Average Joe Finances Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Cavagioni, and today's guest is Dr. Virgie Bright Ellington. Super excited to have her on the show today. We're going to talk about something that we've never talked about on this podcast before. It's a different kind of topic, but it's about medical bills and you know how to beat that because that is something that many americans face all the time every day and it can be a cause of large debt so i'm super excited to have this conversation so virgie thank you so much for joining me today oh my gosh mike i've been looking forward to this for a while thanks for having me yeah, absolutely. For those of you listening right now, we had an awesome pre-conversation before I even hit the record button. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited. So she currently lives in New York. You guys all know I'm from New York. So we got to talking about that a little bit and just vibing really well. So I really like that. So I want you guys to know a little bit more about Dr. Virgie here. So if you could, can you please share a little bit more about yourself, Your share your story? Who is Dr. Virgie? Sure, Mike. So I am the principal of Crush Medical Debt, which is a company, basically a media brand, multimedia brand we started to help people struggling with medical bills, basically to get the American public to have basic medical financial literacy, because without that, you don't have financial stability. And my background is I'm a, many years as a board certified internal medicine physician and about 10 years, a former health insurance executive. And Mike, I thought I knew everything about, I had a full 360 degree perspective of the US healthcare system and the finances and how it worked. And I thought it was fair and just. And the work I did when I worked for an insurance company was to make sure that the, we, that insurance company did not underpay the providers and that they and that things were covered that should have been covered for their members for patients but it wasn't until i became a patient and i realized oh my goodness no something needs to be done so in, in brief i had some medical issues and had to have emergency surgery. I was rolled into the emergency room and went into the or had to have an operation at midnight and when i woke up i thought oh my gosh, you know what? I'm not in an ICU. I don't hear any ICU beeps and noises. I'm going to be okay. And then I heard somebody snoring. I'm like, wait a minute. I must've been really sick because whenever I go into the hospital, I make sure that I have a private room. I was like, I have a room. I must've been really sick. But talking to this roommate, I'm so glad that I had the opportunity to meet her and connect with her because in telling her, talking about her background and our stories, make a long story short, Mike, she told me that she was worried about how she was going to pay for this visit because she was in the hospital for the same thing a year prior. And she was explaining to me on the day of discharge, a representative from the hospital department, uh, billing department came in and said, before you can leave, you have to sign this document saying that you will agree to pay whatever your insurance doesn't pay. And Mike, when she told me that, I swear, the curtain dropped. I saw red. I was enraged because I knew that she had, that this is a mom. There was only one income in the household. She can't work outside the home because they have young toddler children. that aren't school age yet. Her husband works for a 24 hour diner. So very modest income. And I knew that she had just signed away her family's financial future. I'm sure bankruptcy, frankly. And then I thought, you know what, Virgie, don't get mad get to getting, do something. 
And that's how Crush Medical Debt was born. Wow. What an origin story, right? It makes me think about like a, a Marvel superhero origin story. It's like <laughs> you got put in that situation and saw the other side, right? You saw somebody that that was not getting the coverage that was going to help them with these expenses. Not and it's for an issue. It's a repeat issue. Yeah. Taken advantage of. Trick. Right. Bully. So, yeah. Yeah. So you saw the not so kind side, I guess is a good way to put it, right? Now, when going into this, that kind of changed your mindset and how you look at the medical insurance industry. Were you still an executive at that time? No, that's a great point. I had left at that time. I was a, essentially, I was a rock star with this very large health insurance company. And because during the time that I was in charge of their inpatient billing services, essentially being their clinicians, their nurses, how to currently review bills from, from hospitals for the members who have this particular insurance plan, they saved them from the, after the first three years that I was running this particular department, they had annual savings that went from a hundred million dollars to $150 million a year in savings just at the end of it, the three years of taking over the program and teaching their clinicians how to accurately pay these claims. And I had gotten sick, realized that, you know what, I am no longer willing or able to do the hours that it took to do the work. And I wanted to spend, frankly, more time with my husband, my children, and I just needed balanced time, just put it that way. And I just needed a balanced life. Their response was, what's wrong with you? They didn't realize that I had been, or maybe they didn't care, that I was putting in 50, 60, 80 hours a week into getting the results. And when they said, you need to do more time, I was like, no, I am less than five years out from a breast cancer diagnosis. I'm late for my annual screening mammogram. There is someone who's very important to me who had been diagnosed with renal cancer. She was actually my kid's nanny. That when we left Manhattan, she went to work for another family, but I love her very much. And she, I was thinking, you know, she probably thinks I've been so busy that I don't care about her. Out of sight, out of mind. And I thought people first, then money, right? So I said, you know what? I'll make a long story short, I'm out. I made the appointment for my screening mammogram and I thought, okay, I'm going to have time to live life and take care of things appropriately. And I'll never forget this, Mike. My last day was Friday, September 6th. I got up and left the company and less than one week later, Thursday, September 13th, in the morning, I got a phone call that my mammogram was abnormal that they had found another site of breast cancer. And in the afternoon, I got a call from my former nanny's daughter who was outside of the country and couldn't get into the country and said, my mom's been admitted to hospice. Wow. So the, that was a long answer to your question. And I really want folks to hear this, that th th there needs to be a balance and listen to that little voice in your gut. It can save your life. You're not replaceable to buddy except your loved ones, your family and your friends. The company will, whatever employer will replace you faster than you can say, faster than you can make your head spin. In less than six months, I got a call from a former colleague at the company and said that they replaced my position, only half of my position. They made somebody senior, gave her a senior position and had six additional people. They created a team of seven people to replace half of me. Wow. So yeah, before you're only remember people first, and that means you first, you, your only responsibility is to your loved ones. Yeah, no, I think that's important. That is a key thing to write down. I, and I wrote this down too, people first, then money. And because I've seen this a lot, especially in the military after 20 years in the Navy, every three years, pretty much changing jobs, moving to a new duty station, and you're always replaceable, right? Something happens, you're going to get replaced and the Navy will continue to move on. It's the same way with any type of corporation or business out there that once you leave, they will find a replacement and that's going to be that. Whether it's you leave because you quit or walked away, or whether it's you leave because you didn't take care of yourself and you passed on, 
right? Yep. They're going to replace you. Yep. And the thing is, if you're going to sit here and work yourself to death, the only people that are going to suffer besides you is your loved ones, your family, your, your friends, ones. the ones that you know, were telling you, hey, slow down, spend more time at home, you know, things like that. They're right? going to suffer the most. You're going to be Absolutely. gone. You're the ones that are going to suffer the most. Yeah. We can talk about that forever, but I just yeah. want folks to really hear, please hear that money is here today, gone tomorrow. You can always make more money, but your loved ones cannot replace you. They'd rather have you than the money. I swear. I promise you. Yeah. No, that's a great point. Now, Speaking of that, so the folks that usually get caught up in this, that, you know, they get stuck in a situation where a lot of times they're already in financial extremists and then a medical issue comes up and now, you know, they don't have the proper coverage or none at all, maybe, mm -hmm. and they're lies and they get this devastating bill that essentially just, they lose everything. So I know you have three simple steps to get rid of medical debt and hospital bills without going bankrupt. So can we talk about that a little bit? Sure. And what's nice is that this applies to any medical bill that you get that's been generated in the United States. So let's say you need physical therapy, laboratory bills. This applies to all bills. And I really want folks to remember just three simple steps. Number one is very simple. Just pick up the phone the provider that sent you the bill, there's always a statement. And I don't, I'm, I talk about this a lot, but I don't even call them bills anymore, Mike. I call them statements. So when you get that first statement that has this number, I call it a wish number. It's a wish from the uh, provider. It has nothing to do with reality nine times out of 10 because it's not a real bill. It's a statement, not a real bill, unless it has CPT codes. A real, you're going to call the writer's billing department and ask for, quote, a real bill or a bill with CPT codes as per HIPAA federal law, unquote. And CPT, I won't bore you with what it really stands for. There are people that work in the industry, Mike, for decades that can't remember what it stands for. I was talking to a radio host once and he says, you know what CPT should stand for? It should stand for can't pay this. But anyway. Oh, I like call, that. <laughs> right? I was thinking cost per something. It's Common procedural terminology, which is why no one there knows exactly, right? <laughs> so you're going to call and ask for CPT codes. So CPT codes are to medical services in the United States as what our codes are to products in a store. You walk into a store, you grab a product, every product has a code, a barcode. You run it through and it tells you two things, a brief description of what the item is, the product is, and what that particular provider or retailer is charging for it. Same thing with CPT codes. Every medical service generated in the United States, test, operation, hospital visit, ER visit, you name it, there's more than 300 in at this point, probably 50,000 of them. And each service that is you're able to receive in the United States has one. So you're calling for that. Step two, you're going to take, once you get that bill with CPT codes, and by the way, at the time, it'll say something when you'll know you have a real bill when it says CPT at the top and underneath with each service listed with a description or a br very brief description, sometimes not, there will always be five digits. So usually, sometimes they'll start with an alphabet, but usually five numbers, numeric digit. So with that step two, you're going to take those each of those CPT codes and Google them to find out one, just a brief description of what each service is. So it just roughly sounds like the services you believe you've received. You're not getting double billed for something or you're not getting billed for services you didn't receive. That's huge. And two, while you're there, you're going to Google what Medicare, the federal government insurance for certain chronic diseases and those age 65 and older who aren't employed, what they pay for that service. And the reason why I ask you to look at what Medicare pays, because that's a fair retail rate. Now there are people, there's only, I think one or at most two other people that are doing this work and they say offer two times Medicare rate because you're going to get pushback. A lot of the response you're going to get from these billing departments is they're like, you know what, if everybody paid the Medicare rate, we wouldn't be able to stay in business. I'm not so sure about that, but not my problem. You have insurance companies that have negotiated these great prices. You don't have anybody negotiating for you. You're going to use that Medicare price. And step three, the reason why they're going to agree to it when you call them back. Step three, you're going to call them back. They're going to agree to 
what you're going to ask for, which is an interest-free payment plan that you can afford. So let's say that I had a hernia repair operation and the bill that I got with CPT codes was about $10,000. So I do step two, I Google it. And what Medicare pays for those services, it totals about $3,000. When I call them back, step three and say, hey, I'm willing to pay. In my case, I've done research and I am willing and able to pay $3,000. They're going to give you pushback and say, can you do this or that? No, you're going to ask for an interest-free payment plan that fits your budget. Meaning, Mike, if you can only afford an extra $100 a month, if you can scrape together $100 a month and that's all you can do, then fine. But the pushback you're going to get and it's trained to do, this is their job, but let me tell you that they'll agree to, and I'll tell you why. They're going to say, you know what, if you just pay us $100 a month, it'll take us forever, years and years to get paid, to get all of our money. And you're going to be like, yeah, but this is the best I can do. And the reason why they're going to accept that, Mike, is because it's cheaper to agree to that than maybe, how does it go? A little bit of something is better than all of nothing. Right. Chase you down the road and maybe have to send it to collections where they get literally pennies on the dollar. So those are the three steps you're going to follow with any bill. Never, ever pay a wish list that you get in the mail, which is usually the first bill. And it's not a real bill. It's a statement. If it doesn't have CPT codes, it's not a real bill. It's just a statement that's a wish list that nine times out of 10 providers will send because they know that the American public, 99% of the time, 99 folks out of 100 don't realize that's not a real bill. If an insurance company won't pay anything, a statement that doesn't have CPT codes on it, why should you? Yeah, no, that's a great point. It's just, it's a matter of not being informed, not knowing these things. And you get this quote unquote bill in the mail, even though it's not really a bill, but we you get it that. in the mail with these yeah. numbers and you're like, oh, okay, I was hospitalized for this many days and I did catch this ambulance ride and it cost this much. So I guess this makes sense, right? Or I forget, please. My gosh, the ambulance, the ground ambulance services are huge at sending you bills that are just totally total made up creation fiction, just wish list, And they're wrong until you call up and ask for a CPT code and they're billing you. You think, well, I have insurance. Why didn't the insurance pay this? I guess I owe this. If you have a, ask for a statement, a bill with CPT code, you'll look at it. And when you run it through, you realize, wait a minute, I was taken to the emergency room by this ambulance for complications from diabetes, a dreaded complication that is life-threatening. You can die from it called diabetic ketoacidosis, DKA. And I talk about that as an example in my book, Crush Medical Debt, what your doctor wants you to know to crush medical debt. But in this particular case, they were sent a bill because their insurance didn't pay it of $2,400 because it was the CPT code when you ran the description was for non-emergent transportation. There's no freaking insurance company in the whole world, let alone the United States, the for-profit United States healthcare system that's going to pay you for a cush just taxi ride, very expensive truck ride to yeah, an expensive to the medical supplies in it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So you call them up and you say, there's a mistake. The CPT code says that my ride to the emergency room because I had DKA says that it's not an emergency. It was emergency. And I'll go, oh my gosh, our mistake. We'll correct that. Just disregard that bill and you'll never hear from them again. No, every that's, that's single bill, point. Mike, every single bill, hospital therapy, they may forget to apply your co-pays if you have insurance, ambulance services. So yeah, every bill you get always or quote unquote pseudo bill statement call and make sure that, Hey, I need a real bill. And if they give you pushback and say something like that's something you're going to have to ask your insurance company for, or we don't have that kind of bill here that you're asking for, but that's a lot of money. Can we transfer you to our associate who can help you come up with a payment plan? No, thank you. I want a real bill with CPT codes. And if you can't help me, can you transfer me to a supervisor or someone who can help me get a real bill with CPT codes as per HIPAA federal law? And that's great. That's one of the things you got to remember. The folks that you're talking to on the other side of the phone, they have a whole 
transcript in front of them of what to say when you ask for this and what to say when you ask for that. It's, it's the same thing when you're talking to a telemarketer or somebody's calling you to say, hey, they you won this free script. cruise. Exactly. That's yeah. what they've been trained to do. And to be honest, most people really want to help you. And if they can't, it's because they can't. They haven't been trained to do so. Always be polite and ask, can I speak to someone who can help me get a bill with CPT codes as per HIPAA? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, that, that, that is just, it's eye-opening. It's one of those things that if, if you don't ever hear somebody talk about this, you would probably never know. I, obviously, I didn't know what the CPT codes were, and I had no idea that the statement that you get in the mail is not an actual bill unless it has those codes on it. And then on top of that, when you have something with those codes, have a questioning attitude and go look it up and make sure that it was for the actual services that were rendered and not something that accidentally got thrown on there or whatever. Oh, something that may have been, it. yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Didn't know how that got there. Oh, um, darn. How did that yeah. happen? Gosh. Oh, just disregard that. <laughs> All right. So Dr. <laughs> Virgie, what about in a situation, let's say you have private medical insurance or even Medicare, you're in a situation where they won't cover certain medical costs. What do you do in that type of situation? Oh, that's an awesome question, Mike. So what you're going to do in that situation is call the insurance company and ask for the reason why they're not covering it. So what happens is when you have a, you have insurance, when you have private commercial insurance, it's called an EOB, explanation of benefits. When you have Medicare, it's called an MSN, medical statement. I forgot what the N stands for. Anyways, that's basically Medicare's version of an EOB. And you'll freak out when you see all these numbers and prices and things, but don't freak out because if it's from your insurance company, they're not sending you a bill and people will freak out and be like, oh my gosh, my insurance company sent me a bill. No, it's not a bill. And because it's understandable when we freak out, when we see all these numbers. So they've gotten to the point where they put on at least the front page, if not every page, this is not a bill. So just remember that insurance companies, whether it's federal or state or private, they're not sending you a bill. So they're shooting you an EOB, exclamation of benefits or MSN saying what they received in terms of a bill or called a claim from the buyer that provided those services. And then they'll say, okay, this is what we pay for it. Or uh, this is what uh, we will pay once you reach your deductible. So you're on the hook for this because you haven't met your deductible or, you know what, we're not paying for this. It doesn't meet whatever criteria. And often, usually there are codes uh, that they'll put to tell you why the service was denied. And I think that the codes really aren't that helpful for somebody like me, who's an expert. Yeah, I can look at it and see what can figure out what their abbreviations mean, because it's different for every insurance company. Just call the insurance company and ask them to explain why this wasn't covered. And if you believe that it should have been covered, meaning they say it wasn't medically necessary or fancy name for saying not medically necessary is often experimental and investigational, and you believe it should have been covered, talk to your physician, your provider. They have an interest in making sure they get paid too, right? So they are going to help you and their office staff is experienced in dealing with all these insurance companies and how essentially how they get down, right? How they operate their MO. So ask for help. So, you know what? They don't think that this is medically necessary. Ask for a letter from them and have them, they know the process of appealing that denial. So the long answer to the question, Mike, is appeal the denial and ask for help with from your provider. I was going to say, I actually appreciate the long answer because the, it's such a good explanation in there. And I think the key takeaway that I'm taking from this entire conversation right now is to have a questioning attitude. If something doesn't seem right or feel right, ask why. The same thing, if your insurance isn't going to cover it, ask why. They let them explain it to you. And then uh, sometimes they might get caught in a spot where they're trying to explain to you like, oh no, actually you should be covered. That's fantastic. Exactly um, right. Listen to your gut, Mike. Always yeah. listen to your gut. And yeah, don't think that, you know, think about it this way. And this is an analogy I also talk about in the book or that I, and I talk about often is, you know what? People think that it's too complicated to be able to make sure you're not getting overcharged and taken advantage of on your medical bills. And you're, we're often charged 
thousands and sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars for things we don't owe at all. And to your earlier point, yeah, we're being taken advantage of. The for-profit healthcare system takes advantage of our ignorance, the American public's ignorance and not having basic medical financial literacy. So think about it this way. You're not intimidated when you decide, you know what, wait, oh my gosh, I need a new car and, or, you know what, before I, I think about getting another car, let me see if I can get whatever's wrong with my car fixed. Let me take it to a mechanic. Do you have to know how the engine works, how the car works, what a carburetor was, is what it does and that kind of thing. And no fancy car mechanic and car language and words and terminology to be able to know how much you can afford in your payment plan, your monthly budget rather, to pay for repairs. Same thing with medical bills. You don't have to know fancy human anatomy words and terminology and medical fancy words and complicated words to know, hey, that doesn't sound like the care that I received or $2,400 for an ambulance ride, you know, that to an emergency room a mile away when I was, they offered me a ride from a car accident and I didn't even get oxygen. That doesn't sound right listen to your gut. Don't be intimidated. It's just, you're not going to be intimidated to be able to take your car to a car repair place. Same thing with the human body. All very great points. And again, it all goes back to just asking the question. And uh, yeah, I absolutely love that, Dr. Virgie. I'd like to transition this into something called the final round, where I'm going to ask you four hard-hitting, really three hard-hitting questions, one opinion question, just so the audience can get a better understanding of how you are been put in situations that are difficult, right? So if you're ready to go, we'll, uh, we'll get that party started. Let's go. Let's do it. All right, let's do it. Get us started. Right, so the first question of the final round is, what's the biggest mistake you've ever made? The biggest mistake I made was a financial mistake. And I don't believe in, you don't buy new cars. As soon as you drive it off the lot, the second you drive it off the lot, you've lost at minimum 20% of its value. Often if it's a fancy expensive car, luxury car, 30% of his value right away. But I decided when I had just finished training and was a new attending physician and moved to the Midwest for I was where I trained on the East Coast. I'm in the Midwest and I thought, you know what? I'm going to get invest in a car and I'm going to keep it for 10, 20 years just it's a car that's man rather that's known for keeping staying on the road for 200,000 miles no problem. And I thought, okay, I shouldn't do, but you know what? I'm going to keep it forever. So fine. And I'll know that it's been well taken care of. I don't have to worry about blah, 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 blah. Which was breaking my rule of never buy a car that's less than two years old. Okay. So I, and I also don't believe in making payments on a car. Don't make payments on a depreciating item, which is, which are cars. Cars are right. But anyway, it's okay. You know what? I'll just do a free loan. For, it was like, if you pay it off in three years, interest-free, I was like, I'll pay it off in a year, which I did. And Mike, at the end of that year, after I paid it off, my kid's dad and I, my husband at the time, and I realized that we needed to move to New York city, to Manhattan, where you don't need and nor want cars. So I had to sell the car <laughs> within like a year of having it. And it was a total waste of money. I got the blue book value back and everything, but still that was a waste of money. That was a financial mistake. Okay. Listen no, to your gut. Fair. Your gut said, no, don't do it, Virgie. And I did it anyway. Listen to your gut. Back to your first point, right? Yeah, there, there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of talk about intuition during this interview here. That's awesome. All right. So this kind of ties into that, but what is something that you've learned that you wish you knew when you first started? And let's keep this in the medical debt area. So because uh. you you've made that transition, right, from being on the insurance side to now saying, let's question what's happening here. So what would you say is something that you've learned that you wish you knew when you first started that? So all the stories I tell folks, Mike, I'm really glad you asked that question. I have to say it's because I made the mistake first. I didn't know any better. I was a patient. I thought I knew everything, but when I became a patient, I think a lot of us, the American public assumes that physicians and provider nurses, they're honest and accurate. They want to help us. The physicians and nurses, the care providers, they're separate from the billing folks. They're less than 50% of uh, physicians are self-employed or work for their own group. These are private equity folks, bean counters, accountants, people in black turtlenecks who are making millions and millions 
I made these mistakes. And the biggest one that one of the big ones I like to talk about is make sure if you have insurance that there are certain screening procedures that are covered for free, no co-pays, no cost sharing, basically no co-insurance. If you have that, no deductible by your insurance. And this is by federal law, by the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, what some people call Obamacare. And basically it's a federal law, ACA, Affordable Care Act that says for certain age appropriate screening things, for example, in my situation, screening mammograms, other is a, another screening thing that comes up a lot where people get taken advantage of is screening colonoscopies. But in my case, I let a, a provider, the radiologist in this case, when I showed up for my screening mammogram, tell me, you have a history of breast cancer in your past. So this isn't screening, this is diagnostic. So therefore it's not free and you owe us $200. You need to pay us before we take you in the back and do your mammogram. And I knew it, that was when I was still right in the middle of my, I was still working for this insurance company and, and didn't, I knew it was wrong. And I argued with them. I called my doc and said, can you tell these idiots? And it was bad. It's not cool to talk, to call people names. It's not helpful or productive. I'm just going to put that out there. If you're going to call your provider, call and ask for a requisition that has an ICD-10 code, which is a diagnostic code to say, this is for a screening that'll essentially say that because I didn't have that piece of paper. I didn't know to ask for it at that time. They said, no, this is diagnostic. It's $200. And I had to go back to work and I thought, you know what? I paid them and I shouldn't have, I should have just said, you know what, even though I didn't want to, and I was late for my screening mammogram, I'm just, I'm just gonna have to come back. I'm not going to reward inappropriate behavior. So my point is don't do as I say, not as I do. And I came by these recommendations and these steps and what to do the hard way by experience. And I made the mistake. So you don't have. To. Yeah, no, that's great. So you've learned from that too. That was, a, it puts you in a situation where it was a great learning experience, but at the same time too, you even realized that, Hey, just following their script when it comes yes. to, Hey, this is the, what it says on paper. This is what you have to pay. So it's not their fault. Exactly. It's the, so Virgie, it's... it wasn't cool to call them, <laughs> let them over here, you calling them idiots and hood, blah, blah, That was not but you've, cool. You've learned from that because even <laughs> yes. during this whole conversation too, you even said too, don't get mad at the person on the other side of the phone. They're following a the script. It's it, That's their J-O-B, right? right? To try to get, push it this way. But genuinely people do want to help, right? And yes. that, that is one of the things is to always try to look at the bright side. It's even part of your name, right? So you always <laughs> want to look at the bright side of I people. love you, Mike. You're so awesome. <laughs> I'm going to put you in my pocket and take you with me, man. This is just so kind. But yeah, <laughs> you catch more flies with honey than vinegar, right? It's, absolutely. It's, true. it's just real life. Yeah, absolutely. And there's always that saying too about the bees and the flies and why a bee does not have to explain to a fly why honey tastes better than the stuff that the bees eat. So then the flies eat. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Okay, well, let's move on to the next question here. Uh, and that is, and this is a, a good follow-up to what you just shared with us, but do you have any tips or tricks that you would recommend to someone that is just, well, I guess this question could be a little bit different for the medical billing, billing side, but do you have any tips or tricks that you would recommend to somebody that is... In a situation right now where they're already making payments on a medical debt and they maybe didn't follow those first couple steps, I'll change this question up a little bit. I would, in this case, I would go back and apply the three steps and figure out what you should have paid and say, look, this is what is fair. I've been overpaying and this is what I'm willing and able to do. This is what it is. And if you get so much pushback and you ask to speak to a supervisor and they're like, no, you've agreed by making these payments, you've essentially agreed that you owe this money and you have, you've signed this agreement, then I would actually reach out to the Patient Ticket Foundation, which is a nonprofit that helps you negotiate or learn how to negotiate and deal with situations in which the providers are taking advantage of you financially. And that URL address is patientadvocate.org. That's great. And, you know, I was also thinking too, if you could go back and be like, you never gave me the actual CPTs on this in you accordance with the bill. federal HIPAA. Yeah. 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 I want, I want my, thank you. My, you're a smart dude, man. Yeah. 
<laughs> call just back. Learning hey. from you. See, I'm just showing that you're very good at explaining this stuff. I just learned that from having this conversation from you. Yes, sir. Call them back and say, you know what? I never got a real bill. I signed for something that is not accurate. And I think I've been taken advantage of. And by HIPAA federal law, the reason why you want to use that word is because there is no provider that wants to be a test case for violating HIPAA law by you have right to everything affiliated with your care, including the bills, the invoices that go to the third party payers, or you have access hundred percent to everything. And they, by law, federal law, they have to give it to you. Yeah, that's great. That is awesome. Thank you so much for that. It's again, it's about having that questioning attitude and just, even if you're not sure, just ask the question. Yes, if you just please. ask the question, you're either going to learn something that day or you're going to make changes happen. Okay. Awesome. Now the final question of the final round, and I'm going to preface this with besides your own, but do you have a favorite business investing or real estate related book or podcast or both? My favorite financial book of all time is actually not a business book or series it's actually a life book and it is from way back in the day i want to say 92 called your money or your life and it basically teaches you that money is life energy and be very clear about when you buy some trinket or something that you say you really want or some sparkly shiny car that is worth you trading your life energy for it and it teaches you this, it basically takes you through the steps of learning what's important to you, what's important, your morals, your, your values, your belief systems, your life philosophy, because you only get one. This is not, as I say, is not a dress rehearsal. And that's my favorite by Joe Dominguez, who died not too long after that was published, and Vicki Robbins. And uh, I think it's like a personal financial literacy Bible. I, I like that. I'm going to have to add that to my list. I didn't have that. I didn't have that one yet. So I wrote that down now. Okay. So thank you so much for that and for sharing that with us. Now I have the final round's done, but I have the most important question to ask you, right? Because we're sitting here having this awesome conversation. People are listening saying, wow, I really want to know more about Dr. Virgie. I want to know more about her book, Crush Medical Debt. So where can people find this information? Where can they get their book? Do you have a website, social media, anything that, that we can follow and find out more about you? Sure. So the website where you can find the book, you can find a great short training video to complement the book, to help you apply what you're learning is at crushmedicaldebt.com. And you can find everything there. That's pretty easy to remember. However, I will still make sure that we have that in the show notes to make it easier for everybody. Either if you just want to click it or copy and paste, just don't do it while you're driving. All right. So this has been absolutely fantastic. I really, I genuinely enjoyed this conversation and I had such a great time. So thank you so much for joining me. Oh my gosh, Mike, thank you for having me. It's been awesome talking to you and thank you for what you do. Thank you for all you do. Thank you. I appreciate that. And to my listeners, thanks for joining me and our special guest, Dr. Virgie Bright Ellington on the Average Joe Finances podcast today. Go leave us a five-star review and tell us what you liked about today's episode with Dr. Virgie. Aloha from Hawaii and have a great rest of your day. Thank you for making it to the end of this episode. Greatly appreciate you being here with me today on the Average Joe Finances podcast. If you haven't done so yet, make this the episode that you go leave us a five-star rating or subscribe to our YouTube channel. The Average Joe Finances podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only. Have an outstanding day.